and then normalize the stack. <clears throat> and then you can look at your data rejection. And, and uh, I don't know about you, but you know, satellites are a serious pain. Um, sometimes a satellite trail is actually faint enough that it doesn't get picked up well with registration. Um, this one happens to be picked up. And what I like about Stack is that it shows you what it is rejecting. Um, I have, you know, you can tell with the dither, right? We have some areas with the dither and uh, the satellite trail is being rejected. So what happens every now and then because of what I showed you with the moving dust uh, particles, you end up with something like this sometimes. Where, and this one's a double problem. I've got an, an over-subtracted dust donut and I have an under-subtracted dust donut. Because it, so the way I deal with that is I like to repair it right at, um, again, before uh, I move on to the finished um, combined master. So if you blink through the stack, you see, hey, I've got several frames that are without the dust. Um, I go, hey, so there's some with and some without. But what I'll do is you take, there's a, under the data rejection, there's a, a pin. It's called freehand draw. And I make that a good 150 pixels or so. And I just blink through the stack, and I just mark those for rejection. And as long as you have sufficient uh, frames that don't have that problem. This will work real well because once it's uh, once you mark those and then I combine them together, um, the pixels that I haven't rejected come through, and you've got a nice, you know, clean image. Does that come through okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. You do it on each stuff that has the dust bunny. Yes, well, in that, in, in that particular case, I had so many subs that I actually built two. So I built, um, I combined one group uh, that had with and one without, then I just did one and then summed them together. Oh. Um, the freehand tool also works great for that pesky satellite that um, is faint enough that it doesn't get picked up well by rejection. So I just went in there and, you know, clicked along the satellite trail and I, I mean really it, it's it, it's kind of a pain but it does yield good results and I'm not fiddling with it later in Photoshop or whatever. Make sense? Yes. Okay after you know I go through and I make my good um, master frames um, I, I typically will apply some sort of sharpening uh, to at least to the luminance. Sometimes I'll actually apply a, a little bit of deconvolution to um, one of the color frames just in case if I have one night where you know the scene gets a little bloated versus the other. But the whole idea behind this is I, I, I just believe in digging out the details um, and doing it in such a way that hey that you can't necessarily tell that you've sharpened the image. But everything adds to blurring, right? We've got seeing, we've got the way the mount tracks, we've got focus variances, and just you know localized seeing problems. So we end up having to do some. Uh, and, and I found that um, I will apply sharpening um, at the at the right at the get go. Um, I, I like this. Uh, what what Richard and James say here is that deconvolve. Deconvolution attempts to restore an image that's been degraded to its original pre-degraded condition, and you know that's real cool. But we all the big problem is is all of our systems have some curvature uh, to the to the image, so it's not exactly the same throughout. So, um, and and what I found, I thought this was kind of interesting, is a guy that comes to uh, AIC, and uh, he's an engineer, and he took and built this little Hartman mask and he quantified the local seeing on his 20 inch because I always found that if I run my fans all night I've got floor fans and I found if I run them all night I get better full width half max um, results and he quantified why that is and uh, it, it's amazing the, um, 
the difference between turning on the fan and without. Now, if you're if you're uh, you know you can't really do that if you're moving your equipment, obviously. But if those of you who are in a maybe a permanent situation, it it, it does make a difference. Um, sampling, there's a lot of. Uh, and what tool do you use for the deconvolution? Yeah, I'm I'm going to come right up on that. <clears throat> um, first off, a little bit about sampling. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate. What's the perfect sampling? Nyquist, all that kind of stuff. My, my thing is, is that you, the information has to be there to be able to dig it out. So, you know, the the math says for best results, you want to be about twi sample twice as the highest spatial frequency, which is basically saying I like the error too much. You know, on too much information versus not enough. Now, large scale structures like you find in large nebulae, that's why they look so beautiful in white field. You know, that's maybe not as much of an issue. But when I'm trying to dig out, you know, details in a galaxy or something, then um, that's why I do run at 0.43 arc seconds per pixel quite a bit. And the problem is, is that when you do deconvolution, there isn't anything perfect out there, so if you get enough sharpening to, to really go after the small scale stuff, sometimes you're going to booger up stars, you're going to mess up other things in the image. So I like to do what's called selective precision. You either got, you either can wield this with the precision of a surgeon, or with the touch of a blacksmith, which I've seen, you know, which we've all seen out there what you can do to your image if you wield these a little bit too strong. So, and de I, I do use deconvolution in CCD stack. Um, I know there's plenty others out there that work real well and you can do the same thing. They use basically the same principles. Um, in stack, the first thing that they've got to do is make sure we're getting a good um, selection of stars. So we can get a, and what he does is he averages the point spread function across however many stars that you're you're using, and that's where you under the auto select stars. That's the same thing that you use when you're looking for a registration. So you kind of start there, and once you've characterized your system, then you really only have to do that once. You just want to make sure that you have well sampled stars and not um, you're not selecting things that are uh, saturated. And so let's start with some of these interesting little boxes here. Um, PSF fit to Moffat or Moffat or however you say it. Um, if you don't have that checked, it's going to show you the raw PSF. And you see here, this is the raw deal. Okay. Which actually in this particular image shows either that star is a double star or there's a, a slight shift in registration or something. You can see, hey, that that doesn't exactly line up. It's a hair elongated. Um, <clears throat> when you check that, it becomes symmetrical. So you, since we are dealing with star-based light uh, most of the time for this type of thing, that uh, yes, you want to have that checked. Uh, the matrix is the radius basically away from the center of the star that um, you're encompassing. And you want to make sure that is large enough. Uh, Stan basically says set that at a minimum of twice your full width half max. So if you're reading, um, you know, four pixels, then you want to set that at least at eight would be the place to, the place to start. Um, the sharpen count is actually the number of iterations, but it's weird because it doesn't exactly work like you'd think. In other words, the higher the sharpen count does not mean the sharper the image. It is a relationship between all these things, and I can't seem to get a definitive <laughs> on that, but it, it, it's, it's, it's a sharpening transfer where you said that you're actually transferring this flux inward. So I found at least once, and there again, once you characterize your system to see which works best, um, you know, in my case, usually somewhere between three and six works real well um, on these galaxy type images. 
And what you can do, of course, is that you can actually have it attack just a small portion of the image, and you can see the result. And, and when you actually apply this stuff and you hit this little button here on the side, it tries to give you a different look here in the center. And that gives you a little bit of graphical representation on what's going on. This uh, bias subdivisions is basically the, the edge or the wings of stars, and it's trying to find the difference between the background and that edge. Um, and really, it's the relationship between the sharpen count and the bias subdivisions that tell you that, hey, if you start getting you know, crazy um, results, then uh, you know, you gotta, it's, it's, it's weird, the smaller the subdivisions, it kind of works backwards for me. Um, what I typically do is understand I'm trying to get the sharpness like in, around this core of this, this polar ring galaxy. So I will have a ton of these uh, um, that I'll, I'll run, and I'll, I don't care what I do with the stars, because I'm not going to use those stars anyway. I'm going to replace those later. Um, there's two types of uh, decon that they have. Positive constraint, which is um, very good for keeping things smooth and not going crazy. Um, usually 100 to 150 iterations for these smaller details. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll run, them, I'll run it twice. I'll run one for just tightening up the stars. So 20, 25 uh, iterations and then I'll save that aside and then I'll really hit it uh, to go after those small details. Um, and then you can select an area to, to sharpen. In other words, you can draw a box around. Uh, like in this area, I can say, hey, I want to try it, so I'll draw a box around that and then it'll quickly go through it and you can see if it worked well. And once you find the setting you want, apply it to the whole image. So this is before positive uh, constraint with this particular, and this is um, after. Uh, you can see a tightening, nice tightening around um, these H2 regions and these this tidal debris that's circling around the core. But you notice the star, I, I goobered that up. But like I say, I don't care because I'm going to use the original star. Um, and then I, you, I measured the difference is I started, the raw was at 4.8 pixels and it deconned it down to 3.3. So that's, that's not terrible. So it's a slight tightening um, without going crazy. Max entropy is another animal altogether. Um, it works good on really high signal to noise things. Um, it, it's based on your maximum ADU out there uh, on your image and uh, I, I only use it on very select things. This particular image image helping to work. What will happen is, is you got to, hey, you got to find your maximum ADU out there that's not saturated. In this case is about 27,000 counts. And I put a, a lot of iterations at about 150 and um, when you run it, it looks really weird. Um, it, what, it, what it's doing is it's like working its way from the center out and from the out in. And you'll see all these weird um, things happening. But you'll see when it's done uh, that it takes and makes not only sharper image, but it has a lot of contrast to it. It's almost like it's adding a uh, edge filter uh, at the same time. I don't understand the math whatsoever, but uh, it gives a very interesting result. So this is before and that's after. So as you can see, you know, look at the difference here in the uh, contrast in the detail. I blink back and forth. Is that coming through okay? Does it look yes. all right? Yeah. Okay. Now you notice, you know, it really goobered up the, the bright star. But there again, we're not going to worry about it because I'm going to do something that uh, came up a long time ago called uh, multi-strength decon layer blending. And it's basically what we're going to do is we're going to take this, these 
uh, master luminances and combine them together and use the best parts to make the whole. And we'll use masks to do that. So this is kind of how I do this in um, CCD stack. What I like about CCD stack is I can do a pre-stretch and to make these blend together you can't have um, a lot of brightness variances between them, right? Else you'll, it's harder to blend. This looks like building a mosaic. You have to have in each individual panel to have a similar normalized uh, background. And what I like about stack is I can um, on the fly manipulate that and then apply that stretch to the entire stack. So in this case you might have two or three different luminances, one to be the raw and then the other to uh, that are sharpened. So this is an example. Um, you pull up your histogram because you want to make sure you don't clip any of the data. Um, in the adjust display in CCD stack, it's your background slider adjustment and you're going to want to adjust that until you get some shoulder room right here. You move that histogram over and just so there's a gap there you'll be in pretty good shape. <clears throat> And then I usually pull the gamma down a little bit. There again, I'm trying to get about 75% of my way there. I'll finish up my stretching in other programs. Um, but I want a good um, pre-stretch done here. Once we've got it adjusted where we want, then we can apply that to everything in that stack. click the button apply all and then you save those images out as scaled 16-bit TIFF files. So what that'll do for me, that'll allow us to they'll bring that into any other program and they're going to basically have the same brightness values but they're going to have different levels of sharpening. So my next step, we go into Photoshop. It, uh, it, you guys get what I'm doing here? Does it make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. All the pens bobbing up and down. All uh, right. You know what's funny is yeah, I, I always say this to the you know AIC is that isn't it amazing that we all get together and spend a lot of time and effort and money and to learn how to manipulate pixels. You know, it just <laughs> it's a kind of amazing. So I want to talk a little bit about masks. Masks to me are the are probably the most powerful tool that you can leverage in whatever whether using Pix Insight, Photoshop. Masks are the tool to really take your images to the next level. Um, it it provides your best control for doing any type of selective adjustments, and I guarantee if you learn how to master the basics of masks, um, you're going to get more dramatic images. Now I hope I'm not I'm going to just go over the basics of masks. I'm sorry if you're all beyond that, but um, I want to make sure you understand, you know, the concepts. Number one is is that in Photoshop, remember that Photoshop is nothing but a grayscale editor, and they happen to blend channels on the fly. <clears throat> channels are pipelines. They're pipelines for for in, in this case under red, green, blue. They're pipelines for color information. Masks are channels. Okay, so what happens is, is anytime I'm 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 using Photoshop, I always have my channels panel open because there's a lot of things. That's where masks live. Since Photoshop is a grayscale editor, um, that masks are stored in the channels panel. Okay. So alpha channels, have you heard the word alpha channel before, I'm sure? Um, it is a way to store a mask. That's all it is. It's a container for a mask. And remember that masks are channels that don't, they bear no color information whatsoever, like the red, green, blue. So every channel after that is it, it stores a gray scale. And the way that you turn an alpha channel into something useful is you convey transparency through a layer mask. So masks have way more control than standard selection. You know, if you go in and you use uh, 
uh, Lasso or Marquee Tools or whatever. They have way more control than that. Photoshop sees the mask every time you turn that into a selection, and they're interchangeable. That's the cool thing is. Masks and selections are interchangeable. And I'll show you what that means. Um, Alpha Channel also lets you store this stuff for future use. So what happens is as I'm building my image, I've got I go and I make all my different masks. Now you can you can export masks into Fix Inside or other other because uh, they're all pretty much universal. Or you can take a mask from Fix Inside into Photoshop and refine it there too. Just this is this is for you brainiacs out there. Um, Alpha channels being containers. This particular formula run weight. Uh, it won Ray Smith an Academy Award in the 70s because what alpha channels were were a way to show and and deal with opacity and transparency, and it had to do with how to do this in film. So that's hence the name alpha channels. So there you go. Some trivia. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how masks are used and where they you can tell that in my little gizmo here I've got Photoshop up and I have um, my layers panel up and I have my channels panel up and I always have it like this because I want to keep track of my red green blue and my alpha channels and what I have here is a layer that's blank on top and on the bottom is just a white uh, canvas we'll call it. Now there's a couple little rules to understand and what I've done is I've clicked on this alpha channel so we can see it. So the way masks work is that black is a protection of in the transparency control. It blocks so it conceals. Okay white reveals or white selects. So it's kind of like if you actually took and, and cut out a stencil out of this thing and light is going to go through all the white area and black both the light would not. That's basically what um, a mask does. And it always works that way. White reveals, black conceals. Now you can turn any alpha channel into a selection by control clicking it. You hover over it and then control plus click and you get these marching ants. That means it's a selection, and I'll show you how that works. I always say that a presentation without demonstration is just conversation. So we all click on that. You see the, the marching ants. It's now a selection. Now we turn that into a useful mask by just clicking the layer mask button, and bang. Now that's transferred. And now what I've done is I'm painting on top of the canvas with a paintbrush. And what this is showing is that here I painted on here. This mask becomes like a stencil. So white lets the paint through to the bottom white fill canvas. Black stops it. So it works just like if you hand cut out a stencil. Everybody gets that, I'm sure, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. Now, what's very cool about Photoshop CS5 or later is that they have, you got to remember, Photoshop is a tool for people to make compositions. It's a compositing tool. That is really what it is. It's for taking a picture of a pretty model and changing the background and putting her somewhere else are putting different things on her or whatever. Um, that is really the power and that's where most of their money is made is selling the, the software for that. So they've made some incredible enhancements for masking since masking is used a lot. The refined mask tool is that change in CS5. And this is what it looks like. And what's great about it is that when you have the refinement going on, you can either, I use two different view modes, but there's a lot of view modes here. Yeah, all these. But there's two I use. You can either see, the, with K, you see black and white, or 
and that's seeing the mass adjust real time, the mask itself, or you can see the results by using the L, and that's called on layers. Now, what's very cool also is that once you have masks made, you can add them together, you can subtract them, you can find the intersections and deal with those. The, these are very powerful tools. Why would I want to add or subtract a mask? Well, say I have a galaxy, I make a mask, but I want to have a star mask that won't include the galaxy. You can make a mask of the galaxy one of, and one with the stars and the galaxy and then subtract the galaxy out of it. Um, and that would just leave you the stars is one way. But what happens is, is when you, in the channels panel here, when you hover over one of the masks, and you press the control key, you'll see this little box. I don't know if that shows up on your screen, but the little box on the hand. So we'll zoom in a little bit. There's the little box. And that's the, those are the marching ants. Okay, so that's your selection thing. So when you do hover and control key, that will select it. Now if you hover on the mask below it and and control plus shift, you see the little plus sign in the middle of the box. That's the addition sign. So what we're doing here is we select what I'm calling no mask, and we're going to add it to mask as a demonstration. Okay, see the plus sign for add. So this is how easy it is to combine two masks. Control plus click, we get this, that means we selected that mask. You see the marching ants, that means that that is an active selection. Then I want to add this mask, so you hover and control plus shift, that gives you the plus sign. When you click it, you can see now that the mask has been added. Click the layer mask button, and a new mask is created, which is the result of no mask plus mask, or result of those two masks added together. Does that make sense? Now you can see, yes. you, you can really start to see, hey, this is this very simple, a very easy thing to do. Now you can do the same thing um, about subtracting masks. Now if what happens is after you've selected the mask you want to um, subtract from, the control plus alt keys, you get the little minus sign, okay? And that means we're going to subtract that out. And then so when we're all done with that, there you have one mask subtracted from another, okay? I just want to make sure you saw these concepts because if as you dig deeper into the power of masks, these make your life a whole lot easier. So I'm going to start out with a project that I did a while back. Um, there's many people that don't realize that, uh, in fact, uh, we believe this is the first image of it, is the ring nebula has an outer O3 ring. I don't know if you see this. Yes. Okay. And it's very, very faint. I think I've got 36 hours of O3 to uh, reveal that. And we sent it to um, Sun Kwok, who's one of the uh, leading scientists on planetary nebulae and stuff. And they believe it is, but... To confirm it, it needs to have uh, spectra and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, so what this is a composite image where you know we've got the standard ring nebula with um, the core, and then we got the petals everybody is familiar with, and then we now have this background O3 um, area that I wanted to bring out. So I want to be different. I not only want to, sh you know, but th in this particular case, the ring nebula is not my primary um, thing that I want the eye to go to. Here, I do want to see this in incredible, um, very faint O3 ring. So I'll show you how we built this. Unless you, you know, of course, if you guys say no, no, no more, I'll stop at any time. <laughs> Can mm. what galaxy? Did this? Uh, there's a galaxy that's pretty close to that. I noticed that that's not exposed in your picture. Did you mask that out? Um, it's right here. I don't know if you can see it. We see my. There's the galaxy oh. right there. Yeah, I see it. Can it also? I see. Uh, so emission, O3 emission, or 
blueness up in the upper left-hand corner. Is that a separate feature, or is that yes? That we believe that's all separate. Same down in the lower uh, left, and you see some on. You know, I I have no idea. I'm not. I don't know that much about uh, this type of science, but obviously this. And there is um, hydrogen in the background that I suppressed to show the ring better. Um, on my website, I actually have a movie that you can click back and forth between the two, and you can see that it, it covers a very large area. It's kind of, it's kind of different, but. So basically what I started out with is, you know, the, uh, I broke this image up into three different sections. What I call the ring core area, the petals, and then the O3 background. So um, this is how, I'm, like I said, I'm a layers guy. That's the way I think. Um, so the first thing that I want to do here is I'm going to duplicate, I'm going to make a mask for this ring core area. And here, there's lots of ways to make masks in Photoshop. Here's one way. Um, we duplicate it, uh, the layer, and I like to give it a name, so I'm just calling it Mask Build. And then you need to do something to, whether you use curves, levels, whatever, to um, bring up the brightness and contrast of the area you're trying to uh, form a mask. In this case, I just use brightness and contrast and ran them up to the full, full scale to blow it out. Now the, the most powerful tool um, for selection process in Photoshop is called color range tool. And in this case I'm just saying, hey look, um, instead of sampling a color, I just say just 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 select the highlights. And uh, once that happens, you see I get the, the marching ants. And then I can just click this layer mask button and it turns that selection into a mask. Now you'll notice it shows up in both places. The mask shows up as a layer mask and it shows up in the channels panel. Okay, Here's the thing to remember. This is temporary. As long as you have the layer mask, this alpha channel will reside, but they're connected. If you delete this layer mask here, it will leave here. Okay. The reason I bring that up is what I'll normally do is I'll copy, I'll make a copy of that channel because if I do delete it, I want to have something left of where I started with. So in this case, I'm going to right click on that layer mask and I want to refine it. I want to make it better. And that refine mask tool is the way to go. So <clears throat> here's a little demo that shows the different view modes. So what happens is we'll open up the uh, Refine Mask tool. And once it's open, remember we talk about the two different views that I like to use uh, on black and white, which is basically just showing you the mask itself. Okay? And that's the mask in real time. And or L, which is on layers, which will which it hides the mask, but you see the result of the mask working in real time. Okay. So I'll I'll bounce back and forth all the time when I'm messing around with this, and I'll show you why. Um, this little deal. Let, let me go over some of these boxes. The, so we just talked about the view mode. So you can look and see what the view modes are. You can click on this button to show what the original looked like at you know before you started these enhancements. Um, this this edge detection that's a big deal. One of the big advantages that Photoshop came up with is they learned how to um, select hair. <laughs> um, one of the hardest things to select to make a mask on a, on a model was, you know, that the wind's blowing the hair up and they want to be able to select that. Well, if you can select hair, you can select very fine details. The smart radius helps you do that. And then once you have that, everything else is edge adjustment. And then how you're going to output the result, okay? So first thing, I turn on this smart radius, and watch what happens when I crank that sucker all the way up. Look at the um, it detected those edges, right? And now I can shift that edge. I can make I can grow it so it, it expands out, or I can shrink it. 
that is super powerful. Because remember, since master grayscale, it's not just, you know, pure white lets everything through, pure black stops everything, but it's all those grayscales in between for transparency control that control the amount of throughput that you get. So what I did here is I said, okay, I've got a mask now for the ring core, but I don't want these uh, stars to be involved. So there's lots of different ways to remove them. An easy way is I just took a lasso and kind of drew, um, drew around it. And then I invert the selection. So uh, now I'm looking at the outside of the, uh, of the selection process. And then I just fill the background with black. And you just hit the backspace, and boom, they're all gone. Now, so now I have a mask of just the ring core area. So you know, you know, there it is. But since remember, I said now we've done all this refinement. Remember, I said that if I delete this layer or its mask, that this alpha channel will go away. So what I want to do is make sure that doesn't happen. So I right click on it and then duplicate the channel. That's just going to make a new a duplication of this alpha channel that will not go away. And I give it a name. I call it ring only mask. And now I have this new alpha channel and it's saved and for further use, which we will use um, in, in the production of this image. Okay, so here's the not, here's the thing that I'm going to do is I've I I don't know if it, you guys mess around with um, HDR toning in Photoshop. Messed around is correct. <laughs> What's that? I've messed around with it unsuccessfully. Okay. All right. Well, I have a separate thing on that if down the road you want. But anyway, it's a very powerful tool. Um, and what I did was is I enhanced the core with a HDRT. And I want to blend that in. And I put it here on this layer. And I want to blend that core in to the background so I don't so I preserve the background flat background and star color. Okay. And I'm gonna do that with my mask. So there's there's with there's my base, but this is what I want to put in there. But not booger the stars. See the difference in, in um detail? Yeah. Okay, so there's my enhanced layer and I'm gonna use a mask to blend that in. So there's, I, I, I control left click on this mask that we just built, my alpha channel, to turn it into a selection. Now you see I've got the marching ants, right? It's now a selection. Now to turn that selection into something useful that I can use as a mask, I select the layer I wanna apply the mask to, and that's this HDRT sharpened layer. And I just click the, the layer mask button, and then boom. Um, now I've preserved all the background. I've blended through the HDRT. Got a little, uh, show you how it works from the beginning. And these are the view modes. So now I can refine the mask, and then I can see, you know, how it's doing. So right now it's, it's showing me on layers. Here's my black and white. Um, that's the mask itself. And now I can do my adjustments and see that it's working real time if I use the L mode, which is on layers. That's just what that means. Okay, so I'm going to do some adjustments to this. Refine the mask a little bit with some edge detection. And there's my feathered hair. It's detecting it in a nice uh, transition. I'm expanding. I'm messing around expanding that. See how far out I want that to go. And what's cool is that I can save the output either to a new layer, to the layer that's there, which will overwrite it, or I can send it to a new layer with a mask. And that's what I did this time. So there's my new layer and layer mask. And I'm going to go ahead and save that. I'm going to duplicate it because now that I've refined it, I'm going to duplicate it. So if I throw this away, I'll at least keep the mask for further use. So there's before and after. 
okay, so I got phase one done. I've, I've enhanced my ring core areas. Now I want to bring in the petals. So here, um, and the way I blend narrowband data is I learned from actually the Hubble guys. I learned from Travis Rector who wrote the paper on, on this process. Um, we, we had them come in on AIC in 2005 and we use clip layer masks to blend in uh, narrowband data. So in this case, this is, uh, this is the background and these, I'm going to start showing you these clipping masks that we start turning on. So the first thing we want to show is that, hey, I've got hydrogen mapped to red in this case. And they call this HOO because um, I have two layers of O3, one map to blue and the other map to green to get some of that blue-green teal color. So now I've got this, these petals that I like. I like the petals themselves. Um, and my goal is, is to blend in that previous core detail into these petals. So we, we enhance the uh, HA petals. Here's a mask that I built to do this. Control click on the mask, and that's going to make it into a selection. That's step one. Select the layer that I want to, to apply the mask to, and then hit the layer mask button. Simple as that, guys. Bam. So now I've got this. Um, I can alt click and look at the mask at any time. See what it looks like. So there's enhancements blend through. You see that? Okay. So I'm happy. I'm happy with that. So um, now there, the old legacy adjustment panel still around. Is the feather there is a different type of feather? It feathers from um, the outside in versus um, feathering the other direction on the refined mass. So um, you, I did, I do add just a tiny um, feather adjustment on this particular part. So now I want to take and blend those beautiful, uh, the beautiful core details into those petals. So then I'll have step one and two done. Um, there's the petals, right? There's the core details. There's the petals. So I'm going to do this with the mask. And I've applied it. And, okay, I look and go, okay, that's pretty cool. But, you know, the blend isn't very good, is it? You can see that. But with refined mask, we can make that much better. So what's happening is, is we're taking this, blending it through the mask, into the base layer, which holds the pebbles. Okay, so this is cool. Okay, I swear, so you like this. So the first thing I do is we look at this and say, hey, well, I want to see the mask itself, and I'm going to crank up the radius so I can start seeing the hair, right? I want to see the details. That makes for a nice looking transition. I'm going to smooth those a little bit, a little teeny bit of feather. Little key bit of contrast, and then hit L so I can see it real time what it's doing, and voila, it's looking very nice. Now, watch this. Hopefully, it shows up. I'm going to shift the edge a little bit, and you see that pop in. Yep. It's subtle, but it's there. And what we have now, would you call that acceptable at this point? Um, that blend. Um, I, you see the, the, the pedal details, you see the the uh, core itself, um, and we, we successfully blended that. And it, you you can't do that very many programs that easy um, because of this refined mass tool. So we're going to save it as a new layer because it is destructive. And uh, I, I went ahead and deleted the extra layer that it made. Uh, I mean that the, the previous layer don't don't need it anymore. So here we go. There's the ring core details that's blended into the petals. 
Now the next thing I did was I, I removed the ring to leave me stars. Now you can do it with a paintbrush or mass subtraction. I used the mat, you know, since I had a mask for the already built a star mask and asked it to subtract it, and this is what I ended up with. Um, refine that mask, and what we're trying to do is I'm blending in these um, RGB color stars, right? So I'll turn those on, bang, got a little bit of RGB color. Now, that's, now that I have that, I can move on. I want to enhance this O3. So there's a hyper, this is a hyper stretched um, of the O3. It's very faint. Um, and you can see there's a lot of hydrogen in the background. So what I did was I made a mask for that. So there's my M57 with the uh, core and pedal details. There's my blue. Uh, uh, that's my O3 data that I'm going to map to blue. So there it is without any of the, you know, just the screen mode because that's how you, you do this. And later on towards the end, if you want me to show you how you do these clip layer masks I, uh, to, for narrow band data, I can show you. <clears throat> Depends on how much uh, you guys can take. So next I start turning on the color. And start, you know, using levels, and we end up with that. Now, I don't know how well that shows on your screen, but um, so, like I say, the whole goal here was to show, you know, you know, the ring is very cool, but really, what's here is is that you're seeing it um, through the shell of O3. Make sense? Yes. Any questions so far? And you can see it very clearly here, Ken, no problem. This is CS5, is that what it is? Yeah, I did that in CS5. And CS5 is when they actually um, added the algorithms for the better selection process and the refined mass tool. So if you're CS5 or later, then you're good to go with that type of thing. What advantages are there to going beyond CS5? Yeah, I was on the beta team for CC because uh, one of our good friends who's a programmer for Photoshop is an imager. Um, and we were asking him to do something with the minimum filter so it worked with stars. And they did um, have a, in the minimum filter now in, in Photoshop CC, I don't know if it's C6 might be, um, is that they have a roundness feature now. And you can do subpixel accuracy, um, and there's a, a couple other things. But um, you know, there's a few things that's more powerful. Um, I do like uh, CS6 and CC, and nowadays you can you, you can get a pretty good deal and just pay a, a monthly, um, you know, for their uh, their their latest and greatest. But but CS5 really gives you everything you need if you can get that. With the mass tools, I think you're 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 good to go. Um, there's lots of things you can use masks for. Um, you know, one of them that I use a lot is for blending narrowband data. <clears throat> you asked about that picture that I just recently finished. That was a, a horrendous amount of work. Um, I, I've never been a mosaic guy in a three-panel deal, but I had seven filters of data, and um, I wanted my goal was to get an O3 background because most, and but I didn't want the mustard colored um, standard narrow band. Uh, so anyway, I did use masks to be able to do that. Um, but anyway, um, that's one thing. Uh, here's some. Here's another thing I use masks for quite a bit. Um, I use PixInsight to to uh, do a few things to this polar ring galaxy. They have a couple cool. Um, they have more than that, but I, I don't use a lot of it, but I use some of their tools. So I want to blend in some of their stuff. So this is um, their uh, product called LHE. Um, and if you notice, you know, you see some enhancements start to happen, right? So I use a mask to put that in, but not let it impact the stars, right? You know, part of stars is not letting them get out of hand, and when you add 
uh, narrow band or other types of data to protect them um, from those additions. Um, and this is with the HDR turned on. So you go back to this and then blending in these enhancements and those are all with masks. And it gives you finite control of these things. Because my goal here was to show this debris that's circling around. You know, polar ring galaxies, they rip apart uh, the other galaxy and it, then it starts to orbit around the core. And that's what that is. I wanted to bring that out. And it's actually pretty small details. Um, blending hydrogen into an LRGB. A good example. Um, this is my uh, LRGB. And this is raw hydrogen data. And then I used something called a red continuum filter. Um, and I took some data with it. And Don Goldman and I have been friends for a long time. He lives about an hour away. In fact, his first filters were tested on my system. He brought them up, and it's, it's kind of a funny story because he thought it was, they were a total, you know, disaster, but they actually were good. But <laughs> anyway, um, so I removed that. So now we have all this incredible, including the cap, what they call a cap, which is a faint part up here. And blending that in, I wanted to use a mask because I didn't want any of that hydrogen to impact anything else. So this is my LRGB only, and then there I'm adding the hydrogen, okay? And then when it's all done, because you can use mass for color enhancements, that type of thing. So that's that's one uh, one way that I'll use masks. The, uh, here's another is um, I did some work for a professional group that studies the dust moving in front of AE or IG. and uh, so but I want to take the data for pretty pictures too. Um, I like this to call these clip layer masks is that you're the color conductor and it's a symphony of color and that you can control every single layer through opacity adjustments and blending modes and you can you know, have finite control on the fly. You don't have to run it and then go, oh, I didn't like that, rerun it. It's on the fly um, and it, 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 it's the only way I can think. So, give you an example. Um, this is an RGB of, uh, of this, area, this region. Now I've got hydrogen mapped uh, to red using clipping masks, and I turn that's turning on all the hydrogen. Don't need it all, um, so you can start blending it back on the fly, right? Because I want that beautiful um, reflection nebula to show up. So I actually um, layered it on top, and with these you can actually adjust the hue, uh, make sure it look you know you have the proper H beta content or whatever. You can increase the dynamic uh, lightness of it, and that's the strength of the layer. <clears throat> so there's lots of different ways that you can actually control um, lacing in uh, the, the hydrogen data. Um, there's a star mask involved here to, to keep hydrogen from, from impacting the stars. Um, see, a lot of people will take hydrogen and blend them right into the red channel. But you know, then you're you're really throwing everything off. At least with a mask, you can stop it from impacting those stars. You know, stars are a pain. Let's face it. We we to me, um, you know, they they in this case that those bright stars are important. But a, a lot of times, I wish they weren't in our way. They, they, I spend a lot of time. I'll spend two or three hours zooming in the stars at two or three hundred percent and making sure there aren't artifacts hanging around. That kind of thing. I guess I'm a little bit picky, but and there's there's what the mask that's what's called an object mask when you actually take one of the color channels, in this case blue, and turn it to a mask, and then there I added um, that, that final uh, color to the uh, reflection component, so it looks like it's layered on top of everything because it is it you know it very very likely is. In fact, that's what the study was about, um, looking at this dust move in front of that bright star. And um, there again, HDRT, HDR toning, 
you know, blend those enhancements in. You know, using a mask. And we keep this, you know, I it, it put the enhancements in there and protected the stars. And then my star adjustments. And then you adjust the opacity to taste. So you can you can draw it back, you can on the fly adjust everything. Here's another example of how you can use the type of uh, the masking process. These her big hero objects um, shot a lot of it in hydrogen. And this big ring of it in this area and all those structures and using a mask able to blend those in and not impact the beautiful um, reflection nebula and the dust and all that good stuff. You can also use it for sharpening. Um, this is a mask of a galaxy, <clears throat> very weird galaxy. It looks like it has a tail but it's actually IFN or uh, Galactic Cirrus that's uh, in the way that we see this through it. And I sharpened this, I did a deconvolution of just this area um, with max entropy. And I blended in with a mask. So that's the, you know, and you can see, hey, you can see that of a barred spiral structure, you know, more defined, right? And you can also use it for the blend in many types of sharpening. You can take it in the Pix Insight and sharpen it up. Or in this case, it shows smart sharpening being used and using the mask to blend that in. Okay, so now we're at a point, um, you know, now what? I've got more stuff. Do you want me to keep going? Yes. Yes. Sure. All right. Sounds good. So I'll talk a little little bit about ending with the clipping masks. This is like I say, in fact, Zolt LeVay, Lisa Frateri, this they still use this method for blending in um, Hubble data to pr present their pretty pictures. And I find it it's super powerful um, and easy to use. But there's there's a few things that uh, you need to understand about how Photoshop breaks up its blending modes. Um, the, the one mode that we're going to use the most in blending uh, narrowband data um, is the screen mode. You'll notice, though, the way the modes are set up is you have your normal modes, your darkening modes, your lighten modes, your contrast modes. I actually use these inversions or cancellations like the difference or exclusion to make a mask. Sometimes you can you can actually make a mask out of some of those results that work pretty good. So color mapping with screen mode, a good friend of mine, Joel Hagen, uh, took apart a, uh, a color image and put it back together <coughs> using the, uh, reassembled using the multi-layer screen mode that I'm showing you. And you can see that the color is retained. You get a little bit different contrast, but this is raw. He didn't make any other adjustments. So fairly, uh, it, and the screen mode is, is like this. If you had three different projectors, and one had a red projector, green and blue, and you projected them onto a screen, that's the blend that you get, is how is, is what this is doing. Um, here's, here's the in-depth version of it, okay. what, what Photoshop says it is. Multiplies the inverse of the base color with blend color. The basic thing is it does blend everything together just like you would seeing a, a projection. So what I've got here, um, we've got, I, I, I'm going to show you how the, the mapping color works with the clipping layer mask. They're really simple to do and then you can actually make little action files that will do a lot of the work for you. So I've got three different stars here. One is, we're going to represent as H2, one is hydrogen, and one's O3. <clears throat> the first thing you got to remember when you do this, if, if you've never done it before, is that when you bring in your grayscale data, that it, you need to make sure you're in the RGB color mode. It will not work um, if you try and be in grayscale or um, you know, anything like that. So it's got to be RGB color. So that's number one. 
Um, color mapping is based on the position on the color wheel. You guys are familiar with this? Mm -hmm. So that's basically uh, what it means is that 0 or 360 is red, you know, green's right at 120, blue's at 240. You got all this stuff in between. So the number one thing that happens is that we have to apply what's called a hue saturation adjustment layer. Okay, and it works on that color wheel principle. So we give that layer, uh, we're going to do this to S2 because we're going to map S2 to red. Okay. So I like to give the layer a name so I know what you know I'm looking at. Um, the adjustment layer will point to the base layer. So clipping is this. And you can go to layer clipping or you can do uh, so the, the problem is with, with Photoshop, they change the, depends on which version you're using for the, but what you can actually do is hover in between the mode, press the Alt key down, you'll see this little arrow. But the main thing that remembers all clipping means is that any layer on top of a base layer, you get this little arrow saying that this adjustment layer will only affect the base layer it's pointing to. Okay? And you know it's the base layer because now you've got an underline. You see there's no underlines here. Now you've got an underline. So now you've got one, one clipped adjustment that's pointing to the base layer. Everybody get that? That's an important little concept. So what we do in that adjustment is we have to click the colorize box because we're actually taking that grayscale and going to color it. And we got to decide what color it's going to be, and that is under hue, and that is on the hue wheel. In this case, we're going to use 0 or 360 because we're going to map to red. Okay. We, um, there's your color wheel. And you, the other sliders, what you do is you have to crank the saturation all the way up to 100%. And then you crank the lightness down to minus 50. It's a good place to be. Another thing that I like to do, now I've colorized it. Now another thing I like to do, I, I can like to add other adjustment levels, like levels and curves on top of it. And you'll notice all these are clipped. Remember we've got that little arrow. That little arrow points all the way down to this, so all these adjustments only affects the, that layer. Okay. So here's a little demo applying clipping. Uh, mass to each. You watch, I can make adjustments and you can see it get brighter. All right. They provide this real-time control. Here's, there's another adjustment layer and curves. So you can see you have total control of how this thing works. Okay, layer groups. I'm just going to say something about that because it's just for neatness. Is you can start getting three, four, five different layers that go for um, a particular group, and you can just make a folder for them. And they're called layer groups. The beauty about layer groups is they have their own blending modes. So you you can right here is where you add your layer group. This little Square right there is where I got it. <clears throat> you give it a name. You can even get it a color if you want. You need to set the base uh, mode to screen. Okay. So now you can adjust the opacity of the entire layer group. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm adjusting the opacity of the green. I've got two. Here I'm adjusting the green, which is the hydrogen in this case. And you get that mustard color. Remember that everybody sees on these mustard, yellow, red, whatever. You know, it's that means there's plenty of uh, sulfur too and hydrogen. You get that? It's pretty pretty simple. It's just you got to do it a few times. You can easily create an action for doing that. So you just and I have those, so I can just highlight it and say, hey, add those add those uh, adjustment layers for me. And kind of works like that. 
I can say, hey, I highlight it. Mapping red. And it's built all those for me. And then I can make my adjustments. Okay. You repeat that same process for each frame or each master frame of your hydrogen, your, your O3, your S2, and you map each one accordingly. Like in this case, you know, hydrogen's green. So here's my red layer group. Here's my green layer group. Here's my blue layer group. And that's how you map these things. Um, of course, you can always wave the stick and music stop and turn around and bow. And what that means is that you don't want the program to work you. You need to learn to work the program. Um, sometimes we're behind the curve a little bit. So you can see using those, those clip layer masks and using them along with object masks, star masks, you have total control of your image. Uh, you don't have to have these things. There's, I know in PixInsight they have scripts that you can say, hey, give me 50% of blue and do a mixture or whatever, but then when they're all done, what I like about this is I can build my image up like a color conductor and get it exactly the way I want it um, in real time. Does anyone have any questions? I'm going to take a look at everybody here. Where, where are we at? Where's my hangout? If you go up in the corner, there you are. There you go. And you can turn off screen sharing so we don't see each other. Turn on screen sharing. Turn off. Oh, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So that has to be, you know, when you think about it, it's kind of like watching grass grow, right? <laughs> Out the most in Photoshop. <laughs> I mean, really, <laughs> think about it. And we do whole co conferences about this stuff, man. <laughs> when you think about it. But how many of you out there use those techniques now? Okay. All right. I'm using, so, your, I'm using your videos. Okay. All right. And and um. Uh, so those of you who aren't, you think it's something worth trying, or is it too, uh, you, you like other methods better? I've been using masks in Photoshop for a long time, but my uh, my knowledge of, of masking stops with CS3. Kind of, CS3 was like, OK, I'm, I'm here. I've kind of migrated more toward things inside. But as you and I have talked about it at the, at the Oceanside thing, um, your, your style of masking gives a whole lot more capability as far as being able to pull specific details out of the picture. Um, I know that my picture of the ring, my images of the ring, have that galaxy sitting in it. And uh, I've been trying some of your techniques to try to pull that galaxy out and show it at the same time in the ring, even though they're just you know, highly different as far as the dynamic range goes. What your technique allows a lot more capability for Doing that, that, that I can get out of inside. Well, you know, I, I appreciate that, and and I love the fact, you know, when we started AIC in 2004, um, you know, the big thing back then was we I used to call atom block with the uh, uh, 90, 20, 20, 20, so 90 minutes of luminous, 20 minutes of each color. Um, we all go well beyond that these days. Um, we are doing technical art. Right, so the minute we start doing uh, uh, nonlinear stretches, we've kind of taken the science part into the background. Um, my personal goals are to show whatever I can, but don't create artifacts or things that aren't necessarily not there. But um, the hard part about all this, and this is what's interesting, is that we we have 300 people come to AIC. We take surveys, and the number one thing they want to know is processing. Um, getting the data, um, 
you know, data acquisition, doing all that kind of stuff, it seems to be much easier because we must be all gearheads. We get that. Um, but the processing part is where uh, a lot of us have, you know, challenges. And, um, you know, it is it's because it's different. Um, fixed Insight, I've seen grow from, I was on the original uh, beta team for a little while. But it, honestly, I said, this is like flying the space shuttle, you know. Um, and I left it, but now I've gone back to it because there's some great, and I know there's a there's a group that say only fix insight, but I'm of the firm opinion that you can't have too many tools in the processing toolbox. Use uh, whatever you can to make it the way you want. Now I use H, um, a, a program called you know within, and, and this happened I think CS5 or later. The uh, high dynamic range tonal tool, and I I'm able I love it. I think it provides a lot of dynamic use to it. I have a little short on how to, would you be interested in seeing how that works? Or are you done and dead for the night? Uh, can you talk a little bit about the latest about that uh, that tri panel mosaic that uh, uh, that uh, you uh, sent me the link for? Oh, sure, sure. Um, hmm. Let me see if I can move something over here. I've got, I have a processing computer that's, that's a little bit different. Um, then, because uh, what I can do, I think I can bring this in and show you that what basically I did with that is I used Fix Insight to build the actual master frame layer. So I used CCD stack to build the individual frames. Because I still like to blink through and make sure I'm not, I've got everything as clean as I can. I brought them into uh, Fix Insight, and I was impressed. I used, uh, frankly, I used Warren Keller's uh, tutorials to learn how to, I went and quickly learned how to put together a uh, mosaic. And um, they were very, very easy to do, um, much simpler than uh, the processes I used before. Um, I build those master frames, and what you do in there is you, you and I use the luminance as a um, template and just registered everything to it. So I ended up with seven master frames that are three panels wide. Um, and then I brought those into uh, CCD stack again, and I did that pre stretch where I used their DDP and such. Uh, just to get it about halfway there, exported those all out and brought them into Photoshop. Hey, Ken, out of curiosity, do you have a light that's shining on your face or a bright light? I can move stuff. Your face is highly, oh, that's probably much better. Your face is highly overexposed. Is that bad? Oh, yeah. Hey. Oh, look at that. He well, actually has a face. I thought it was an albino. <laughs> This space has massive dynamic range. <laughs> That's what the, what the issue is. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> well, you were waving your hands around, and all of a sudden the picture got significantly better. When it got, when it went in front of the light. Well, light. see, that's the hard thing. I'm a walk around. If any of you have ever been in my presentation, I'm moving and stuff. This is this is really different. Right. So I'm going to see if I can get something over there. I'm going to move it. I wonder if I can project my uh, my processing computer hand on that anyway. So I guess the big thing about this is there, the tools I used in Fixed Insight on that was once I built I built a synthetic luminance. I took the luminance and I took the hydrogen and did a blend of the two. Because um, I normally on Nebulae will sharpen luminance and I don't sharpen the color as much. Um, and I took the RGB component and took it into Fixed Insight. And one thing I found at Fixed Insight that has, there's about four or five ways you can enhance color in Photoshop, you know, as far as saturation. Vibrance is one of the tools that use a lot. The problem is, you see, what I do is I take a lot of classes online from Photoshop experts, that, but they don't, it's not about astrophotography. So I found out that vibrancy was made to saturate an image but leave uh, your face tones alone, right? So you start cranking up that 
um, saturation, and it, so it's not a true saturation curve. And I will say, on um, this image, I found that Pixin, and I can get all the color I want out of Photoshop, but Pixin cites um, curves transformation, where you can click on the little button that says uh, saturation, and you can do that as a curve, and then you can take the other tool, which is um, another saturation tool, where you can, you can take individual components. I was very impressed on how you could bring up the, the, the color and, and be fairly noise free. You have good control um, about without blowing out the color channels. So I use that, and that was actually the first time I've used Fixed Insight to actually increase the color. Usually once I'm in Photoshop, I'm done. Um, but I just exported the TIFF, took it into Fixed Insight, cranked up the color, brought it back into my layer stack, and then started blending in everything. But you guys have all seen the wall in different looks, right? Your, your LRGB, are, they're beautiful. But, and narrow band's beautiful, but I didn't want the, um, how can I say, the, those, and I love, I love uh, narrow band molecular clouds and that reddish mustard color. I love that, but I didn't want that. There's a lot of that. I wanted the natural look, but I wanted that O3 curtain behind it, the beautiful blue um, so, you know, building those clip, clipping layers like I showed you, taking O3 on top, I was able to bring it forward. That makes sense? Yeah, that's what, it's very definite the O3 layer. When I'm looking at it, the old O3 layer seems to stand out in front of the image, and I haven't seen that before. Yeah, so let me see if I can pull up a uh, yes something that I can show you. <laughs> But it, it is, uh, what I had to do was mask it, though, because you know how you get those magenta stars, right, when you stretch that red? Yeah. And those those O3 three together, you get that magenta star. So using a mask to layer that in so I didn't touch the stars, you know, helped a whole lot. I was able to actually control it. And I wanted it, the O3 to start right at the mountain range, I guess you call it, the molecular clouds or whatever and then move up. Um, so we just masked that in um, and layered it on top. It was a long time. I spent, I don't know, I average spent 20 to 30 hours in post usually. Um, this one was longer because uh, there's this more area. And I know there's guys like you that's going to zoom in and look for where I screwed up. <laughs> I couldn't see anything in full resolution. That was probably the point. Well, well, the funny thing is, is that image you sent out that's at fifty percent res, right? I didn't upload the full resolution. That's oh, yeah. actually fifty <laughs> percent. Yeah. So let's see if I can bring this over. So you guys all from the from a club? Is that what you guys? Uh... Yeah, it's, this is the San Diego Astronomy Association. Uh, this is a group that deals specifically with astroimaging, or at least people who try to be astroimagers. Um, the club itself has got 550 members, and there's probably 150 that are you know, semi-active or active imagers. Uh, the group that you're talking to here is everybody who, you know, who really wants to be good at it. Uh, we have some world. We have some really, really good imagers in the club. Uh, Jeff Herman. Um, um, uh, Vince Bird uh, with the rattlesnake, they're, they're excellent, excellent astrophotographers. Uh, so we've got some really good guys in the group. Um, unfortunately, most of them are now out of town or out of the area. So I've been uh, coercing folks such as yourself to you know, sit in their front rows and tell us how they do it. Uh, Craig Stark's been on a couple of times. Uh, we had... Uh, He's a good guy. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Uh, any, of you, any of you guys go to AIC yet? I've been to AIC a couple of times. Um, are, you, um, are you doing it in 2015 again? Yeah, we've been working hard. Um, we're, we're working hard to try and figure out a way to do it cheaper. The costs started getting out of hand. Um, and uh, 2015 is definitely going to happen. We've brought in some new board members and uh, we, we just had to take a break. It was, uh, you know, kind of a crazy thing. But as you know, if you work in 
three B work. Uh, this it became like a job. I mean, it was a huge deal. So. Um, yeah, I don't really have. I don't know that I can have anything I can actually go through step by step on this. But you know, that was it basically using the same things I showed you is building them, putting them on in layers, using color, you know, the color balance tools to get the background, you know, right, get the, the, the colors right. And that's why I'm still a Photoshop guy, um, because when it comes to that level of control, I have not been able to, and, and I see a lot of beautiful work in the big sense, I have nothing against it, but I like having all of it, you know, at, at our disposal. Anything else, guys? I've got uh, I've got one thing. I'll I will let me uh, pull up for you because this is everything in a nutshell, and it's is as simple as this. Now, I don't. Can you still see my screen, or what do you see? No, I need to share. So we need to go back. We need to click up the board. We'll click share. share All right. Your Screen share. This is cool. Cool program. I get, I get it back. You get used to it. Greg got, got used to it pretty quick. He'd actually been using it. Stark had actually been using it for uh, for his work when he got into it and found that it was working quite well. All right. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. So this is how easy it is. It's just as simple as this. This is how you create an astro image. There's the solver. As the term goes, all you got to do is. Yep. All you got to do is. All you got to do is. There's the, there's the hydrogen. And these are all in clipping mass. Oxygen. Start assigning colors to each. Green. Blue. Now, so you got sulfur plus hydrogen together. Bring in the oxygen. Got all these pink stars, but we'll deal with those. I always take some red, green, blue for star color and for filler. Now I've blended in the RGB stars. There's some uh, sharpening and contrast enhancements. And that's it. There you go. That, that you, like that. Everything you need for uh, for tonight. It's <laughs> well, how come, how come you just didn't do that in the first place? You know? I know. See, I, I had to bore you for an hour and a half or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! All right. Well, I you know you, you tell me what you want to do. I'm I'm at your disposal. Um, I think we're good for tonight, Ken. We we've, we've got okay. things to run through here, but. Uh, very much appreciate it. I will hammer on you again to do something else. No worries. All right. And, I, and let me just say thank you. There. You know, it, it all comes down to the fact that we, uh, this is a great hobby. Um, people are very serious about this. And I believe in the free transfer of information in this hobby. So there's nothing you guys, any of you guys can email me. And uh, I may say, hey, take a look at this or or that, but uh, you know, I'm i you know, definitely love to help people uh, get more out of their hobbies. So I appreciate your guys' time too. It's fun. All right, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Click. Stop broadcast.